it's difficult to actually uh, render the complexity of the history of medieval map making. Make basically because we, we are not left with all the artifacts. So we presume that what we have is representative of what happened then. There were different kinds of mappings. Certainly the most striking was the tradition of the medieval mappa mundi. Mappa mundi is a Latin expression, literally means cloth of the world. Cloth because the world was painted on a cloth, on a mappa, on a map. This is where the English word map comes from. It was painted, it was depicted on a surface and then I will have to describe maps that I, I think you can imagine. But what is interesting is that even though the, this world was painted on a flat surface, people in the Middle Ages knew very well that the world was a sphere, was a globe. This is one of the most <laughs> misleading uh, prejudices of modern historians who thought to uh, dis dismiss the predecessors because they were ignorant. And then this legend, which is a 19th century uh, legend, that even Christopher Columbus thought that the, the world was flat. This is rubbish. They knew very well from Aristotle, from Greek science, that the world was a sphere. So what you find in this medieval Mappa Mundi is just a portion of the sphere. It looks flat only because it was rendered on a flat surface. But what you find in a medieval Mappa Mundi, in a medieval map of the world, is the representation of just the northern hemisphere. And the northern hemisphere, according to medieval scientists, was composed of three parts. Europe, Africa and Asia. Of course, in the Middle Ages, scholars would uh, adopt the classical law. They would use classical authors, geographers, Strabo, Pliny, to describe especially the distant parts of the world, of the known world. So what they depicted in this Mappa Mundi was this tripartite world. They uh, render it in a typical structure which maps historians call TO structure. Why TO? Because they, this northern hemisphere, this known part of the world, was represented as a O, as a circle, in which a T is inscribed. The O was the ocean. The T represented the, the, the water bodies, which divided the three parts of the world. The Tanais, the Don, dividing Asia from Europe, the Nile, dividing uh, Asia from Africa, and the Mediterranean Sea, dividing Europe from uh, Africa. Of course, these um, maps were not only geographical facsimile of the Earth, as our own maps, but they rendered human history. This is perhaps even more scientific than our own maps. In the Middle Ages, they knew very well what we are told now by uh, especially 20th century phys phys physicists, that you can't separate time and space. They are joined together. We can't think of a place without attaching a time to it. And perhaps modern cartography, very modern cartography, recent cartography is catching up the Middle Ages intuition with now with animated cartography, digital cartography. Time is getting back into the map. But this is the very first thing that should teach us to be more respectful of our own past. In the Middle Ages, they knew very well what they were doing. They knew, for example, that, map, that, that time and space were intrinsically uh, joined together. The other thing which is perhaps uh, impressive for a modern onlooker of medieval maps is that maps were orientated with the east at the top. Very often when I show these medieval maps people say, oh this is wrong, the north is there. <laughs> no, it's just that it's orientated in a different way. Orientated, orients is the Latin word for east, because east is at the top. East is at the top because the sun rises in the east. Interesting feature that distinguished 
uh, medieval mapping from modern mapping, something that I would explain to a modern onlooker, to a medieval mappa mundi, is that for medieval map makers, direction, proportion, exact distance was not important. You wouldn't then judge a map as distorting features, not exact, because th this was not their concern. What they were concerned is just to show that a place was contiguous to another place. Historians talk about topological approach. A medieval Mapamundi would show you just that India was east of Persia, that Persia was east of Greece. But they were not concerned to show you exactly, this came later with the nautical cartography and with the Ptolemaic cartography. It is true, however, that medieval Mappa Mundi was not the only kind of maps circulating in the Middle Ages. They were already in the 10th century, but they, this is another kind, another genre of map making. They were zonal maps, maps which were not based on history, as the medieval Mappa Mundi, which included human history as displayed on the uh, stage of geography. These zonal maps represented the globe, again another hint that they perfectly knew that the earth was a globe, as divided into climatic zones, following Greek science, so according to astronomical criteria. The torrid zone in the middle, the two temperate zones in the northern and the southern hemisphere, and the two uh, northern uh, very called polar zones. It is regrettable, in fact, that we are not left with many uh, examples of medieval uh, cartography, but there are some very beautiful. The very first map coming to my mind is the Hereford map. The Hereford map is called the Hereford map be because it is kept in the Hereford Cathedral. And um, it is a very typical example of how the world was represented. We find elements from classical histories and geographies. If you look for uh, your place, London for example is in the bottom left because these maps, as I said, were orientated to the east. At the center usually you find Jerusalem, but not, all, not always. This is a later development due to the age of the Crusades in the late 11th, 12th centuries, in the later Middle Ages. Usually you find this um, uh, network of very important, I would call them, uh, place events. Places where important events in human history took place. For example, you have at the top the Garden of Eden, at the top because it is in the Far East. Then you go down, very often, for example in the Hereford map, you find Enoch, which is the very first city founded by men, according to the Bible. Then you keep going down, in other words, westwards. You may come across the Tower of Babel, for example. Then you go down, you can come across uh, important uh, event places or important, I would say, chronotopoi, so event, ep epoch uh, zones. For example, the Persian Empire, for example, Greece, and then Rome. You have in the representation of the Mediterranean basin a mixture of past and present. You still read in the Middle Ages the names of the Roman provinces, and you have also modern emporia like Genoa, for example. You come across Rome, and then the, of course, the most detailed part of this Mappe Mundi was Europe and the lands near to the cartographer. And the representation would end at the bottom with uh, the western edge of the Mediterranean and the Pillars of Hercules. The Pillars of Hercules were really the end of the world. Other examples include the Ebstorf map. The Ebstorf map is a beautiful map, unfortunately destroyed during Second World War in Hannover. The Epsom map has an amazing iconography. We are left with very detailed photographs and we see this uh, very detailed representation of the Earth on which 
a gigantic figure of Christ is superimposed. Christ as the head in the far east, the two arms outstretched and the two hands are in the extreme north and the extreme south and his feet are in the uh, extreme west. At the centre is again Christ represented as raising from his tomb in Jerusalem. But this is not all of it. It's, the map is so detailed and full of stories and, 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 and uh, uh, details um, in a different way. Another series is the corpus called uh, the Beatus map, these very ma early maps uh, uh, attributed to this monk Beatus began in the 8th century Spain, are very interesting because they are completely different style and you find paradise very prominently represented in the east. So there are many, many examples of this kind of map in Mundi. Zonal maps, you find the so-called Macrobian maps, these maps inspired by Macrobius, the author who described the division of the globe in according to climates. And they are, of course, uh, they accompany, sometimes they accompany texts, maps are found in manuscripts, so they are tiny. But some other times, like the Hereford, the Epstein map, they are huge artefact. The Hereford map was displayed in a cathedral, scholars have tried to understand where and why. And you find also maps drawn because of uh, prestige, power, and the other very important genre of medieval map making, and this is a later development but very important for the history of maps in general, are the nautical charts, maps made for the very practical use of navigation. And this is another story, it's the story when medieval map making evolved and had to include much more geography and less history. We should also bear in mind that the use of those mappe mundi was very different from our own use of map. Mappe mundi were not used for direction, for travelling. Uh, for that they had the, uh, descript the written description of the itineraries and we find uh, references in the maps themselves. The map which were used for navigation were used for practical uses and even though there were also those maps which were drawn to make very prestigious and ordinated gifts to rulers and, and, and princes. So this is very different, even though the, in the Epstoff map you find a reference to the fact that you could see the world and use it to orientate yourself. Uh, there are many discussions about why, what was the exact use of this. Certainly the map viewer was put in a kind of position of God. He was able to see, when he would look at the medieval Mappamundi, to see the entire span of human history, from its very beginning in the Garden of Eden to its very end, the second coming of Christ, which, for example, was very detailed, in a detailed way, represented on the Hereford map, where the second coming of Christ really crowns this geo uh, temporal, geochronological display of history because it's the very end of that history. is when Christ comes showing the instruments of his passion as a sign of regality, of dominion, and then the Virgin Mary pleading for the sinners, and then you see on, on, the, uh, on Christ's right hand the blessed invited to come to heaven, and on the other side, the sinners and the damned being precipitated in hell. So these are, this is a scientific representation of the world to allow a whole vision of human history and geography.